So welcome back to Everything Marketplaces, where we talk with founders and leaders from some of today's top marketplaces. So this is episode 100, so a really special episode for us, where we had an incredible group chat with Mike Gaffari, who's the general partner at Canvas Ventures. So Canvas Ventures is the leading Series A and Series B stage fund that focuses on marketplaces and, have, and has invested in the likes of Fly Homes, Roofstock, Rescue, AirVet, Zola, and many more. So prior to Canvas Ventures, Mike's been over seven years as a VP at Yelp and also the CEO of B24. So there's some really incredible experiences as both a marketplace operator and now investor. So this is a really great chat with Mike where we dove into some of his previous operator experience, insights from now investing in marketplaces at Canvas Ventures, and also had a really great Q&A for those on the chat. So I really enjoyed this conversation. and know you're going to find it a great watch to the end. So, Mike, welcome to the uh, group chat. You know, you've uh, actually been a highly requested group chat guest for quite a while now. So this is a real treat to have you join us here today, and especially since it's our uh, 100th group chat. You know, so I first off want to start by saying, you know, huge thanks for taking the time to uh, do so in advance. You know, so I'm really excited to uh, chat about all your great uh, market, uh, marketplace operator experience, you know, going back to your time at uh, Yelp and Eat24, and then now on the uh, investing side at uh, Canvas Ventures. Um, but before we really jump into things, I think it might be great if you can start off by sharing a little bit more on your background, though, for those that I don't know you. Yeah, thanks. Well, thanks for having me. Really excited to be here with you guys today. Uh, and this is a lot of fun. I love uh, what you're doing around building a, a community for marketplace founders, operators, executives, or even someone who's interested in joining one or starting one, as well as investors. I think that's great. Marketplaces are really exciting, and that'll connect with my background. Uh, and, and so it's great that you picked this area and, and building a community here. So applaud your efforts, and thanks, everyone, who's participating. So uh, my quick background is I started life uh, doing a computer science degree, got started uh, very early and young in the startup world. I you know grew up in Cupertino, so maybe it's just in the water. Uh, and I did my first startup in college, did a, a joint uh, MBA, JD grad degree, and while I was in business school, I kind of uh, got really excited about this idea of venture capital. I said, hey, I like working with lots of startups, helping multiple startups. I couldn't pick just one. I thought that was really exciting. So uh, I started at Summit Partners, was my first kind of post-business school job, uh, a, a VC firm that's a little bit of a later stage kind of growth firm. And I decided I, I was really excited about the early stage. I wanted to focus on early stage founders. And I also thought, um, you know, you're asking me about my operating background. I thought, you know what, the best VCs that I know who are at their early stage and the one and the kind of VC I want to be is someone who really can draw on founding and operating experience to actually help founders and have some credibility instead of always just being on the financial side. So I actually spent the next 10 years after Summit, um, this is from 2007 to 2017, starting growing, building companies. Uh, at first, I co-founded Stitcher. Uh, that's a podcast company uh, that we worked on, kind of online radio that's still uh, popular today. I was a trial pay a payment startup. And then I spent the longest time operating at Yelp. I was at Yelp for seven years as an exec, VP of business and corporate development. And then we acquired E24 and I was CEO of E24 for my last two years at Yelp. So that was a two-sided marketplace connecting uh, restaurants and consumers. It was um, the kind of the pre-DoorDash model, more like the Grubhub model, um, which was very profitable, 30% EBITDA margins, uh, believe it or not, but very susceptible to the last mile delivery folks like DoorDash coming in. So we could talk about that so if that's interesting, but we grew to 500 employees and you know 700 million in gross revenue. So we got quite a bit of scale. Uh, and then around that time I said, okay, a lot of VC firms are recruiting me. This is my chance to kind of go back. If I do want to do VC, this is the time. So I went back into VC uh, five years ago in 2017. First at Social Capital uh, briefly. And, you know, for longer, I've been at Canvas Ventures, where we invest in marketplaces, is actually one of our top three areas, as well as fintech and digital health. I'm on the board of six companies now, including Fly Homes, New Breaks, which is an on-demand auto repair marketplace, Rescue, which is a marketplace for restaurant kind of maintenance and repairs like HVAC, plumbing, the whole back of the house, um, and various other marketplaces. And I invested in uh, marketplaces as a personal investor prior to that, including uh, Fair Wholesale, used to be Indigo Fair, Cloud Kitchens. Um, and, and, but I also invest in non-marketplace companies like Strava, Superhuman, and some others. 
so that's the quick background. Happy to answer any questions. Um, you know, personal too. I'm a big mountain biker, snowboarder, and I live in uh, Marin County, California, near San Francisco. I love it. That's a. I mean, that's such an incredible background. It's almost like uh, we only have an hour, right? So where do we start? Um, <laughs> But but I guess you know going going back to you know your time at Yelp and then uh, mm -hmm. you know E24 specifically you know um, could you share a little bit more about uh, you know the E24 acquisition and then uh, you know as you came in as the CEO you know maybe uh, what some of the biggest challenges were? Yeah, that was a really interesting time, right? So at Yelp, I was VP of Business and Corporate Development. That business development usually means lots of partnerships, especially for a marketplace. You know, there's some debate like is Yelp a marketplace or not? It kind of is, right? It's matching these uh, consumers and local businesses, but we didn't have the transactions on platform. So I led about 200 partnerships and then started building the MA, did our first few acquisitions. And we said we, we actually launched a platform for transactions where you could transact right there on Yelp. We said, <clears throat> hey, we're not doing the transaction ourselves, but maybe we could do it through partners. And we quickly realized we did this in a bunch of verticals. We had like hotel bookings with a startup called Hipmunk and some others. We had, you know, event bookings. You could even book like a winery or golf tea time. Uh, but then we uh, we had food delivery early on. We realized it would be pretty valuable. And so we put food delivery in this little company, E24. I think when we first partnered with the company, I first met them. They were like 10 or 15 employees. It was tiny. Um, they just out executed everybody on the platform and started growing really, really quickly. And we became their number one source of new users, and they were the number one partner on our platform. So at some point we said, hey, this is really valuable. And I told them, look, I don't want to wake up one day and read in the Wall Street Journal that you got acquired by somebody else. You know, we're, we're a key partner to you. You're a key partner to us. Please let us know if something ever happens and we would maybe be interested in acquiring you or we could keep partnering. And one day I did get that call saying, hey, there's been some M&A interest. Would you guys want to take a look? And coincidentally, we were pretty interested ourselves. Um, so we, we entered those um, M&A conversations um, and it was smart, you know, like looking back, I think uh, as a company, we probably should have gone even more early and more double down kind of aggressive at food delivery. That if you look at how big DoorDash and Uber Eats have become, that was really one of the biggest grand prizes for a marketplace around local businesses to create a big market cap. And Yelp, we dipped our toes in the water and we did this acquisition and grew to a certain scale. Um, but, but there's actually even more opportunity from there. Um, but so, so we acquire the company and then there's the whole process. Once you acquire a company that's a partner of integrating that company, uh, how do you get, there were 150 employees at the time of acquisition and we grew it to 500 employees in two years. And we, you know, that, so that's about three X growth. We more than tripled revenue in that time. Um, and so like, how do you do all those things? That's a whole, that's a whole challenge, you know, happy to answer any questions that we can kind of get into. Yeah, I would actually I'd love to uh, dive into that a little bit more. Yeah. So um, a, a few of the things, uh, you know, first, first things first, when you do an acquisition like that, it's all about the people, right? So, and I bring that, you know, now when we're in investing in a company at Canvas, I look at it in a, in a similar way. It's like, okay, who are the people we're investing in? How are we enabling them to succeed? It, you know, teams are first and foremost, the most important, of course, the team you're investing in has to be in a market that has a lot of upside, like the food delivery market, um, you know, was one example. And so we came in there. Uh, one thing I did on the first day is tell everyone like, hey, you've all got your jobs. We want to retain everybody. Like, that's really important and kept them. And, and also, I spent a lot of time. We spent, you know, I had spent years getting to know the founders of the company and leading up to the acquisition. We spent months, you know, lots of uh, dinners going into the evening and, and, you know, multiple whiteboard sessions of like, here's how we're going to map everything out. And then we have to have a clear plan. The founder uh, who was the CEO, there were a few co-founders, but the main kind of co-founding CEO to his credit was very mature, raised his hand and said, look, I'm, I'm going to stick around for a certain amount of time because this is my baby. I want to see it succeed, but I'm not a corporate guy. I've never imagined working a big public company. He's like, Mike, I think you should just run this thing. And uh, that's not something I was planning to do. But at the same time, the Yelp board kind of asked me the same thing. They said, hey, if the CEO is not going to stick around, someone's got to run it. And we think you're the best. You know it the best. You're the best suited to do it. So I said, okay, you know, that, that sounds like a great experience and challenge. And I really love this business. Uh, but getting that whole CEO transition uh, was, um, you know, something we, we took very seriously. Luckily, it was kind of his idea. So... 
I had his full support in kind of doing that. And the team was just incredible. They were great to work with um, and, and really helpful. You know, I, there's, it sounds cheesy, but there is a first 90 days kind of business school type book that has this whole, and they have four quadrants, like decide if um, you're doing a turnaround or you're helping something that's already growing. And this was something that was already growing. It wasn't a turnaround. So really good advice from that book is when you're entering a new situation like that, a new leadership role, or you're taking on, maybe when you hire a new executive, you can give them this book at your startup or a new co-founder you're bringing on, someone in a leadership role. And, and the key thing is if everything's already working and going up and to the right, the, the challenge is you get some sort of leader or overeager MBA type person comes in and they want to change everything. And that's actually the worst thing to do. Like things are working. Why would you break everything? So for that first 90 days, actually more about listening, observing. And my natural stance is lean forward. I want to jump in, get my hands dirty, do work, make, the, make some changes, you know, show, show that I'm, I'm doing a good job. But I resisted all those impulses. I really prepared months in advance to say, I'm just going to calm down take a deep breath, you know, get to know what's going on, observe, help, support, maybe catch little things, take notes. If there's something I want to change, write it down. You don't have to do it right away. And then just get to know it because it's working. On the other hand, if there's a turnaround and everything needs to change, like if the, the ship is sinking, you're going to run out of cash, then it's emergency mode, then go all in. It's someone who's too calm or lean back. It's the opposite. They need to learn how to get more aggressive. Because if you're running on fumes, you don't have time to sit there and observe and learn and ask questions all the time. You have to, you have to actually, you know, have a bias for action during that period. This is uh, this is really great. So I uh, also did uh, also want to uh, bring up the point. I guess it's for some context. You know, this is during the time of the. Uh, I guess we could call it the uh, infamous food delivery wars, right? Yes. Um. So what was it like being in such a competitive market? Oh, the food delivery wars was such a fascinating time. Uh, it, you know, it, it was really interesting. Um, when we came on the scene and when we made this acquisition, Grubhub was kind of the undisputed leader only because they uh, acquired Seamless or merged with Seamless in New York. Grubhub was based out of Chicago. So they kind of had a lock on the Midwest in New York. E24 was actually the biggest on the West Coast. If those two hadn't merged, the three would be like roughly around the same size. Uh, and Postmates was still relatively small. Uh, they were, you know, they had a good hold on LA, but E24, I think, was, was maybe doing more volume. And DoorDash was just rounding error. Uber Eats actually hadn't even launched yet around the time we were making the acquisition. They were just starting. They were pitching to, to work with Yelp as a partner, actually. And so we're trying to figure out that. Are they going to be a partner or a competitor during those couple of years where we grew substantially, right? We grew around 5x. It was... That's quite a bit of growth, growing to 700 million GMB. And it was this race to, to a billion GMB. But DoorDash and Uber Eats, oh man, those companies just hit the ground running and grew rapidly. And that's because they had last mile delivery and they opened up this whole new paradigm that you could just get any restaurant you want. Prior to that, you could only get restaurants that had a delivery driver. That was the E24 model. The way we had 30% EBITDA margins was the restaurant had their own delivery driver. That meant the average ticket, the average order was actually cheaper. A lot of times the delivery driver, by the way, was like the restaurant owner's son or daughter, or nephew or niece, somebody who worked in the restaurant who was like idling and not answering the phones or doing something and they could they were free to go out and do a delivery. So it was actually lower cost to the consumer, higher margin for the restaurant and more margin for it. it was, in some ways, a win-win because you had some of this labor that, that was being underused or the family that owned the business. But for consumers, it was lacking one key thing, which even though it was a lower price, it was lacking consumer choice. And consumers love variety and choice, you know, in a category like restaurants, they want to be able to access everything. And that was the golden goose for these, um, you know, DoorDash, Uber Eats, and, and Postmates to a degree. They were able to really capitalize on that. And so those delivery wars, we kind of had one hand tied around our back. And we saw that to really compete, you know, I said, look, I've delivered incredible growth up to here, but it's actually, I, and I kind of told the Yelp board this, like, it's not going to continue with the current strategy. We're either going to have to get into last mile delivery, which will sink the profitability of all of Yelp. So here's this other challenge. You've got Yelp, this company that was kind of around break-even profitable, a young public company, intense pressure from the public and shareholders to show at least break even profitability as a young public company. But meanwhile, DoorDash and the others were burning cash like nobody's business. They were all about investing in growth. That's a benefit of being private. It could have been a very different story, let's say, if Yelp was private 
and we could have just raised bigger rounds in that heyday. Now, in today's environment, um, with you know interest rates going up, inflation higher, and capital maybe drying up a little bit, I don't know if the food delivery wars would have played out the same way. But in that high availability of capital, super low interest rate environment, uh, it was a tough game to not be able to invest in growth and unprofitable last mile delivery. So it, around that time, Yelp also struck into a big partnership with Grubhub. And they said, well, Grubhub is going all in on last mile delivery. And we ended up as part of that strategic partnership selling E24, I think very wisely. And that's right around the time I was leaving. It all kind of worked out well where we said, we've had a good run, but if we're not going to do last mile delivery, we probably don't want to own an asset in this business anyway. So I think that was the right move for Yelp, short of maybe doing a take private and going all in on last mile delivery, which would have been a very high risk, potentially high reward, but also a high risk move. Yeah, that's uh, super interesting. And it's uh, really cool to hear about it, you know, from the uh, inside. So can only imagine yeah. what it was like. Yeah. So, yeah, so, uh, so kind of transitioning now into the investing side, uh, you know, to Canvas Ventures, you know, what led you to uh, joining Canvas Ventures? So Canvas uh, is an amazing firm. It was founded by uh, a couple of friends of mine. So Rebecca Lynn, uh, who came from the Morgan Thaler Venture Fund, and she's been doing venture for, you know, well over uh, 15 years. And, and that's when I met her 15 years ago, when I was co-founding Stitcher, believe it or not. So like 2007, eight, we were raising money. And she actually brought us into Morgan Thaler. She wasn't a partner yet there. And she likes to joke. She said, well, um, you know, more, she, her partner didn't see the light or whatever who she was working with. She wanted to do it. And, you know, Benchmark at NEA ended up uh, seeing it and doing it. But she at least, she and I got a friendship coming out of it and kept in touch all these years. And then um, she partnered with another guy from Morgan Thaler, Gary Little. They, they co-founded Canvas with Paul Shaw, another friend of mine from a decade ago. We actually believe it or not, became friends over marketplaces. I joined shortly after I joined Yelp 12 years ago, Paul approached me. He said, hey, Mike, you're the BD Corp Dev, you know, Yelp marketplace guy doing these 200 partnerships. You have a front row seat to all, you know, I was, I had on speed dial the founders and, and head of business development and product for, you know, Uber and, and companies like DoorDash, Airbnb, uh, you know, all the, all the dog sitters and walkers, like everybody was building an online marketplace. And he said, hey, I'm a, he was a marketplace investor and he had just invested in Howes um, and Elance, Upwork uh, and, and a bunch of other great marketplace companies. He said, look, why don't we compare notes and talk about them, talk about supply and demand and building critical mass. You know, I, I have this marketplace checklist I've developed over the years. Actually, I can throw it into the chat. The URL is, you know, I don't want to... Uh, get a, a typo here. So I'll just paste it in marketplacechecklist.com. But for those maybe listening later, if you don't have the chat, if you go to marketplacechecklist.com, that walks through all the questions I'll ask uh, with a marketplace, right? Like which side of uh, the marketplace values the other side more, supply or demand? And we could talk about where some of the academic kind of underpinnings uh, and, uh, around this, the, these questions and theories. So Paul and I would nerd out on this stuff. So uh, so fast forward, you know, more than a decade later, uh, when I was I was at Social Capital briefly. Social Capital kind of changed shape, backed away a little bit from venture. A bunch of people were leaving and got, went heavy into SPACs. Right, right before I left, was starting to kind of think about that. And I said, well, I'm more interested in early stage venture. You know, from the start of the story, when I said my background, that's why I got into this. And so my friends Paul and Rebecca said, look. We've co-founded this firm. We just are, you know, just raised our second fund. Do you want to come join us? Um, and it was kind of serendipity. Uh, I probably should have joined them earlier, but it all worked out uh, really well. And so, th so that's how I met them, got to know them. And, you know, the fact that our, our interests were very aligned too in terms of marketplaces, fintech, digital health, the areas that we're looking at, that all worked out well as well. You know, my partner, Rebecca, I mentioned some of Paul's investments. My partner, Rebecca, just had a big IPO with the company Doximity. Um, which is a marketplace uh, for doctors in the healthcare field. And I think that went public and went up to like $20 billion market cap this year. I think it's, you know, it's down to something more reasonable along with the rest of tech, but, but still a very valuable um, and, and impressive marketplace company. Yeah, that's a, a really cool story. And it's also uh, it's cool to hear about, uh, you know, the marketplace kind of nerds. Uh, yeah, the marketplace nerds. Yeah. That could be good. Like you should get swag t-shirts. Let's say, or that hat, you know, put the marketplace nerds. We, we might have to do that. So. Yeah. 
Awesome. Yeah. So could you uh, kind of give us a, a high level overview of uh, Canvas Ventures as a fund? Yeah, happy to. So Canvas Ventures is a, we're on our third fund now. We were founded, um, you know, less than 10 years ago. It, we've got uh, about over $800 million total assets under management. We're currently investing out of a $350 million fund where we lead series A and B investments in marketplaces, fintech and digital health companies. That includes, I've done a lot of like prop tech, real estate, software and tech, um, like Fly Homes, Darwin Homes. We've also invested in Embrace Mortgage, Keyway and others. Uh, those are under the um, the kind of fintech, prop tech umbrella. I also do a lot of food tech, if it's a marketplace or a software-based business like Rescue. Not so much food tech, like synthetic biology. Sometimes I say food tech and, and that also refers to like trying to create you know, alternative meats and stuff like that. I'm not a biologist, so I, I don't spend as much time there, but definitely on the marketplace side. Um, so those are the kinds of things we do. And we'll typically take a board seat, lead the series A and B. We're all actually former founders, you know, and operators have helped start and build companies. And so we really like to roll up our sleeves and do the work and be there um, for the founder, really be on the ground, help them with hiring, uh, you know, so recruiting, building the company strategy, uh, fundraising, of course, uh, we're really available in there and kind of, you know, pick up the phone and help them see around corners. That's kind of our our style. Yeah, that's uh, great. Actually, uh, Cole G from uh, Res Q, is, uh, he's in the community in one of our previous group chat guests. And uh, awesome. I believe, uh, you know, uh, Brandon from uh, AirVet also. Yeah, those are both sure. two great portfolio companies for Canvas, both marketplaces. And so we're, you know, really happy about uh, about those. And, and we have we have many more, too. Awesome. So you didn't mention that Series A, right? So um, could you share maybe an example of like, uh, you know, maybe some of the kind of uh, the metrics or kind of benchmarks uh, you look for in, uh, for Series A right now? Yeah, that's great. So the marketplace checklist, we go through all those questions with any marketplace, but those don't have specific metrics or benchmarks on them. Um, so I encourage you to read those, but th these questions around, hey, you know, what are the, how strong are the network effects? which side values the other side, you know, more than the others, what are switching costs, which are really important. So I think those are all really important. We can get into any of those, but let me get into specific benchmarks since you asked about, about that. And that's kind of off the checklist. One is uh, at series A, any marketplace has got to have GMV, you know, meaningful GMV. Uh, it's hard to pitch a marketplace at the idea phase or pre, you know, like, oh, we don't even have any GMB running through the platform, maybe proof of concept. That's more of a seed investment, frankly. It's hard to get a series done, series A done that way. Probably the lowest that you'll hear of a marketplace uh, getting series A funding would be at a million GMV, but usually it's actually a few million. And the reason is most investors, not all, and most marketplaces get funded for their series A after they have some monetization via a take rate. So, you know, let's give an example. Let's say you've got uh, a $5 million annualized GMV run rate, right? That doesn't mean you're doing 5 million a month. That means you're doing like 400K a month in GMV. And then you've got a 20% take rate on that, which would be attractive. So now you've got, you know, about out of that 400, you're doing 80 something thousand a month in net revenue on your take. And that annualizes to a million dollars of annualized net revenue. Now you're a candidate for Series A, certainly. In the froth of like 2021, maybe you even raised the Series A a lot before that. You were even looking at your Series B. But I think especially now, um, you know, SaaS investors for a long time have had this, hey, we're looking for a million of ARR. ARR. And I think the marketplace equivalent, one thing I, I, you know, just being kind of technical here, but if you want to show your investors uh, and potential investors that you actually get the math, I please it with a marketplace. Don't call it ARR if it's not recurring, because that acronym means you know annual recurring revenue. It's not annualized run rate, which some founders are like, oh, footnote, or they want to put that's how I meant it. Just write run rate and you know net revenue, um, and I think people will appreciate that. And so, unlike SaaS, you don't need it to necessarily be recurring. People get it's transactional. People get that it's lumpy and it might have some more churn in there. That's all okay, and we can get into some of those churn metrics. Um, but if you have that million in net revenue, that's great. Deals get done though all the time with um, you know something more than a million in annualized GMB, uh, but less than a million in net revenue. And that all will depend on your growth rate. So let's talk about the next metric, annualized growth rate. 
you want the GMV and um, and net revenue. Ideally, uh, before your Series A to have tripled uh, in the year leading up to that. Uh, if you if you're not tripling, let's say you're not going from you know a million to three million GMV, and with your twenty percent take rate in that case, you would only be at six hundred k annual net revenue when you got to the three. It's just really hard to see how you know. There's this SaaS formula that works well for marketplace net revenue too, which is the triple, triple, double, 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 where you go from about one million, let's say, or a little more, to about three million, and then they kind of round it up now nine or ten million. You know, if you were at one point one to three point three, now you're at ten, and then you know from there you can kind of double to twenty, double to forty, double to eighty. And you're well on your way to 100 million in revenue. That's a nice pattern that investors like to see. It's aggressive. I think in this new era of potential recession, which we're not officially in yet, the growth pressure has come down a little. Uh, but but you're still it, it's tough prior to Series A. You're kind of in the good, not great. If you doubled your revenue but didn't triple it prior to Series A, if the way you got to your million in net revenue was at a rate slower than uh, doubling at less than 100% growth, then it becomes really tough. If you're experiencing less than 100% growth and you have like less than you know a million or two in GMB, I'd say you're at the point that you need to pivot and really get experimental. Whatever you've got is not working for venture scale. Unless you can get profitable or have some you know family relationships or somebody that's gonna fund you through that, it's not compatible typically with what venture capitalists are looking for. So that's in terms of growth rates. Um, and then I can pause there, but there's obviously lots of other metrics you look at, like, uh, uh, you know, things around churn. And then you'll hear a lot of marketplace investors talk about liquidity. But actually, the liquidity metric is notoriously elusive and vague to define. We can talk about, you know, different ways of defining that. But I'd say, you know, churn and then how you acquire supply and demand uh, you know, what's the CAC and, and LTV to CAC on those are all also very important questions. Uh, this is, uh, this is so good. Uh, so that, that got all the questions coming. So, um, we, yeah. we might just go ahead and jump into the uh, group Q and A, if that sounds good to you. That sounds great. And you're going to moderate and just read the questions, right? Great. Yeah, I'll actually uh, call on the founders to come on. Um, oh, perfect. Even better. Thanks. Uh, Caitlin, did you want to jump on? I know you had, your yeah, I, I had a question. Hi, Mike. Nice to meet you. Hi, how you. are you? Nice um, to meet you. Yeah, I founded a marketplace called Maxible. Uh, it's for housing oh. development. Uh, so I was I was curious about when you were talking about E24 to kind of go back earlier in the discussion uh, about how you said execution really made the difference for them. And we're at a similar size. We're about 10 people plus some contractors. And so I'm curious if you have any insights of like kind of what you think that they were doing really well that other companies weren't doing at that stage. Yeah. So a few things. One is uh, they had their cake and eat it too. I think for the last several years, uh, people have looked at a trade-off of you can either grow insanely fast and burn a lot of cash, or you can not burn very much and grow slower. And the amazing thing about E24, the Goldilocks, if you can do it, especially in this environment, is they were growing really fast and burning very little. Not only burning very little, they actually got EBITDA positive. And, and they were they were kicking off cash. The founders actually were able to pay themselves bonuses and they never raised outside venture capital. It was like incredible um, and because they had these 30% 30, 30 EBITDA margins. Now, how do you do that? One big, big technique for your marketplace I always talk about is find a unique source of organic growth for one side of the marketplace, ideally both. If your strategy is that you're just going to pay up to acquire for supply and demand, you're gonna have a very hard time. Why is your marketplace gonna succeed over somebody else? Someone else can literally just come copy your website word for word, you know, and you can write an angry blog post saying they copied me and we've seen a few of those recently, but there's usually not much recourse and they can just outspend you and it's a race to the bottom. But if you have some unique tactics, something truly defensible, something creative, something different, that can stand out. The founder of E24 had worked in a pizza restaurant saw how inefficient calling on the phone was for delivery. And you know now it seems obvious in hindsight, but he realized, hey, there's an opportunity here. He was early. He then, this is an Israeli founder who spoke English with an accent. You know, wasn't He didn't go to any fancy American universities or anything like that. So he didn't automatically understand American culture necessarily. 
But you know what he did is really smart. He put out, he, he's a very creative guy. He put out this outlandish blog post, uh, or sorry, job uh, requisition, uh, said, we're hiring for basically a weirdo to run our creative marketing team. Like if you, if you can't fit in in any other company and you're a total oddball and you're like a geek, but you make these, this like crazy humor. So he put up this job post. He said, come, come apply for this job. And he got this amazing uh, creative uh, woman from Berkeley who was an English major who uh, was like, yeah, I don't like normal jobs, but this is like this crazy blog post. And she helped build this team. And they had this, the, just the, the most innovative, creative uh, content on organic growth team I'd ever seen. And they did you know, PR stunts, uh, email campaigns. We had a, a weekly email list that you know, when, when I left, I think we were doing like 3 million people a week were getting our weekly email. And just, you know, if we emailed these people daily, they'd be annoyed. But their unsubscribe rate was exceedingly low because the emails were hilarious. We made the best jokes and we had these funny things and video, all this stuff that the creative team came up with. And that was like a third of our orders every week came from that email list. Imagine all the paid, you know, you know, acquisition you're doing. Imagine you just got a third of your orders for free because a couple of creative people had this, this great email that everyone was reading, right? Now that worked for E24, you, you know, that might work for you. It might work, something else might work better for you. But really thinking about what are the, you know, sit down over a weekend with your co-founder, like what are the 12 organic user acquisition ideas we can come up with? And how do we really chase these down? They were, you know, for that one thing that worked, they tried 10 other things, across, you know, from, from billboards, which are paid, but are like different to, you know, to radio ads, um, you know, again, paid, but offline, not at least like super expensive online user acquisition to like uh, physical tchotchkes, events, marketing, so many different strategies. You know, Yelp, by the way, was also built on organic user acquisition, uh, SEO with Google, community and events was a big part of it hardly any paid acquisition for the entire first decade of the company, frankly. So those are all some of the, some of the tactics around their execution that were really effective. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. That's great. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. That's, that's great. Hey, uh, David, do you uh, want to jump on? Okay. Awesome. Uh, Mike, nice to meet you. Uh, David Krieger. I, I'm running a company called Onder, which is a managed marketplace. We're a, a subscription membership marketplace for homeowners uh, to take care of all their home services. Cool. Um, I, I was curious about your, your talk on metrics. Um, and we're actually working with a hybrid model where we have both recurring ARR for the membership, but also transactional volume coming through, you know, one-off services. And I'm just curious how, as an investor, you think about a, a more hybrid model, because it totally makes sense that you want to separate out actual ARR versus GMV. Um, but when you have a hybrid model, maybe like, uh, just curious how you think about that. Yeah. So, uh, we, you know, Rescue has had a hybrid model. There's a lot of these like SaaS enabled marketplaces. You know, there's come for the come for the SaaS, stay for the marketplace, come for the marketplace, stay for yeah. the SaaS offering. I, I think A, that can work well and, and has worked well for, for several companies. I guess the one thing I would caution you, I've also seen some companies get a little bit stuck in the middle where uh, they don't know where their revenue is going to come from uh, or what's going to be the biggest driver. You know, one question I like to ask any company, some companies come in when they pitch for series A or B or, or whatever round. And it's a very clear, like, this is the one thing that we do. This is the one thing that's going to make a lot of money. Here it is. Uh, some companies though, others, maybe even half come in and pitch lots of things. Like here's all these different directions we could go and all these things we could do, or maybe just two things like SaaS and a marketplace. And my question to that, those companies, the latter half are always, uh, what do you think is going to be the key driver of your revenue five years from now? Your net revenue five years from now or 10 years from now, imagine you're going public and you're, you're in the IPO, you're on the road show, you're out there, you're on television, you're talking to the bankers and you're saying, this is what my company stands for. You know, for Airbnb, it's we put people in homes. Yeah, we've got experiences and we have this and that. But you know, at the end of the day, like we get people to sleep in homes. And is it couch surfing, which was they did some originally? No, it's usually actually someone has a dedicated space um, in that place 
where the host is not like interacting necessarily in, in a shared space. Like this is what we do. It's very clear. Uber, it was rides. Like later, yeah, we added Uber Eats and all that stuff, but they went public on the on the ride share business. It's very clear. DoorDash, yeah, we might do grocery, we might do this. So what I would ask you is, you want to just have a clear vision of what that thing is. You're going to go public on this. Even if for some time, let's say you're going to go public on the marketplace, but SaaS is going to be bigger for like five years or three years. Just be very clear about what your game plan is and how it's going to work and, and keep your eye on the prize of that golden goose because I have seen founders get lost and forget which one it is. And, and in reality, sometimes it's you don't know. And so you want to keep that optionality. Uh, but a lack of focus can be, can be a big pitfall if you're not careful and you're not just making the full push on one. So I'd say that's, that's probably the biggest meta point to watch for. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. That's a great question. Hey, uh, Pratik, did you, uh, you want to jump on? Absolutely. Thanks so much, Michael. Um, so, so I've been working on a marketplace, right, Mike, you know, which is really, uh, I mean, it's really like a sales talent marketplace where I'm connecting uh, companies with fractional sales talent. One of the things that I'm always confused about are the retention metrics. Um, what is a good retention metric, you know, for a talent marketplace? Yeah, for a talent marketplace or any marketplace, I think the key is that after a certain amount of time, that could be three months, it could be six months, sometimes it's 12 months, you see some kind of a plateau where um, one or both side of the marketplace, uh, you know, supplier demand tends to just stick around and not churn anymore. And so you know that while you have to get all the stuff at the top of the funnel and some of them are going to churn out, eventually they'll stay. And that can frankly vary quite a bit. The, the best in class plateau you'll ever see is something uh, for for like the demand side of the marketplace. Let's say it's involving, um, you know, for and for you it might be supply on a labor marketplace. But one one side is more churny, right? And so for talent marketplaces, um, obviously that's usually um, more the that's probably more the supply side. In theory, the people who need the jobs are kind of consistently going on. You know, that could change in a recession. And so for your more churny side, 70% uh, plateau retention of the original cohorts is like best in class. But frankly, even 50, you know, even 30 or 40% could be a great plateau if you can show that it really stays level after that. Um, now on a talent marketplace, ultimately your, your supply could just turn over quite a bit. You could say, look, you know, the, uh, we have one and done type people who come in, maybe they reactivate a couple of years later. Uh, I think what you have to show is that your demand side, um, the employers, that they really stick with you. So I think if your plateau retention on, on the demand side, the employers is too low, um, or if it doesn't plateau, let's say you just consistently churn uh, anywhere from three to you know plus percent three to ten percent or more um, but even at three or four percent a month of the of the of the employer side and that keeps going down month after month after month and there's no end in sight you're still 12 months out churning to the problem is investors can say this is a leaky bucket we actually have no advantage we eventually fast forward a year or two have lost all of our supply and have to refill it all and the demand was the more churny side. Supply was supposed to be the more stable side. Um, so that's so you can apply this logic to any of your marketplace. You know, even if it's not labor marketplace, talent marketplace, even if it's reversed, if your more churny side can't plateau, that's a problem. Uh, or sorry, if your less churny side can't plateau, that's a problem. And ideally, you can show like what Uber and Airbnb could show was that they had some stickiness on both sides. One of our past uh, group chat guests, uh, Colin, uh, he's actually the former uh, chief revenue officer at Outdoorsy. He wanted to jump on. So, uh, hey, Colin, you want to you wanna come on? Awesome. Well, question. So follow up on the retention side. So this has always been something that I've like um, thought about a lot uh, in my last role and how to, how to make it. Um, do you actually find um, that, you, that businesses can actually meaningfully change their retention and repeat rates over time? Like... Is it is it more of a like factor of the type of business it is? Yeah. Or inherent traits versus it's yeah. like nature versus nurture kind of you know yeah. uh, question. I, I think that's a fascinating question. I would say 
for better or worse, yes. Uh, this is painful as a founder sometimes. Your category, the business that you're in, probably has an inherent underlying churn rate uh, that, and, and some kind of you know, floor on the lowest you can get the churn no matter how hard you try. But much like nature versus nurture, it's kind of like uh, it's only you're only going to be so good at basketball or tennis or whatever, like no matter how hard you try, or, you know, only there, there's some some level of talent in sports and in a lot of things in life. And at the same time, there's a lot of skill. If you think about someone who never practices basketball, never actually tries to develop some tactics, learns how to dribble, practices shooting, you know, compared to someone who even if they're born with some talent. Um, you know, some, let's say someone born with talent, never practices, someone born with a low level talent practices every day for a year and tries all kinds of new tactics. I'd actually bet on the, the person who practices every day. Right. So, so, so the point is, it's not like you can just sit there and not try everything humanly possible to try to drive that churn rate down and try to get the best in class retention for your vertical. Right. Cause if you don't do that, your competitors do. But especially if you find that you have like two or three competitors, you're, you know, you're trying your best. You think you have best in class kind of user retention and referral programs and organic growth and all the, your, the email campaigns we're doing. It you're doing everything possible. You're really trying. You have lots of people focused on it, but you're, you're doing your absolute best and your competitors, no one's beating you on retention. Then, yeah, you might be, for better or worse, hitting the plateau and how good it can get for your category. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does. I, I think one of the, the things that um, we experienced at Outdoorsy is just an interesting one is that, you know, the type of purchase, at least on the demand side, was such that people, you know, did it once a year or once yes. every three years. And like you couldn't really, you could marginally change it, right? Like the effort spent to get incrementally more wasn't, ne wasn't necessarily worth the, the cost of you trying to spend all that effort. And so it was just one of these interesting, you know, questions of like, from an investor perspective, is your repeat rate good, quote unquote? And it's like, well, it may not be good, but it is what it is, right? And like, you just have to change your business such that, you know, for like a business where demand side, you get one purchase, you have to be contribution margin positive long run on that purchase to make it work, right? So I know it's just an interesting, um, how do you think about those types of businesses where it's like maybe non-obvious at front, how to operate it? Yeah, I'll give two data points for that. I think it's a great point. So one is Airbnb, um, I think started by with this idea that like, it might be tough. This is very occasional. People aren't going to go, you know, go to some faraway city and sleep in somebody else's house all that often. My personally, my first couple, the first few years of Airbnb usage were like once a year. Then over time, it really built up. One, as they got a critical mass of supply. And then I think the smart thing that Airbnb did is try to take the behavior that you're doing and think of it as like, it's not a company, it's a movement. Airbnb defined this category of like, there's this whole new movement of a sharing economy, of sharing your home. Like what if Outdoorsy could do the same and really get people to have this idea that like, we're gonna actually create more repeat behavior in the whole country and the world around this. And it's a new kind of marketing you guys maybe haven't done. That's where I said, kind of thinking outside the box instead of the standard playbook of just retention tactics of sending referral emails or whatever, you know, whatever it is, but really actually kind of increasing, uh, changing the game. That'd be one thing. The Airbnb example shows it could be done. The other one is, you know, selling, cross-selling other services or categories. You know, New Breaks is a company that started with, on, it's on-demand auto repair, starting with brake repair. But I don't know about you guys, like hopefully your brakes don't need to get repaired more than once a year, you know, maybe less. Um, that's limiting. They always knew that. Then you can add on all these, that we like the company, can add on all these other auto repair categories. You know, are there for your company, is that the answer? Can you add on other categories? Uh, but with Airbnb, adding on other categories, frankly, wasn't the, the big prize. It was this redefining cultural movement around the sharing economy that actually worked better. Thank you. Thank awesome. you. That's a, this is a really interesting question. So, hey, cool. uh, Jennifer, do you want to jump on? Loving the talk. I have a question for you. Um, so I'm the founder 
of Blossom. It's a wellness creator market network, and we're um, giving our wellness creators better tools. And we're also building it as an on-ramp into web three tools and i'm just curious if you've seen any marketplaces doing this well um really this being this bridge um for creators between web two and web three you know i haven't there's not a company i've invested in yet uh doing that i think we're starting to see a, a, a real boom in web three marketplaces and i think out of all of web three you know there, there's obviously lots of opportunity there i think Phase one of Web3 outside of like, you know, um, layer one and, and some of the, the foundational stuff, there was kind of uh, uh, fintech and DeFi, a lot of innovation there. Then obviously, you know, and, and lots of coins and tokens, lots of NFTs. Uh, I think there's also gaming applications. Uh, but outside of those foundational areas, marketplaces are where I'm most excited. And so, so I do think there's lots of opportunity there. Uh, there will be other competition. I, I think I've seen other startups pitching this, but I don't know that there's one I've found where I said, oh, they're doing this extremely well and, and being that bridge. And, uh, you know, there, there's always this debate or question of, is that going to be a valuable thing, kind of porting over being the bridge? Or is, is Web3 native the bigger opportunity? Mm -hmm. So you've got to kind of ask yourself, but I, I think it's worth, it's an area worth looking at and, and certainly encourage everybody to think, as you're thinking about marketplaces, think about, is there a meaningful Web3 marketplace you could build? And at the same time, I'd say if you have an existing marketplace that has nothing to do with Web3, whether it's you know outdoorsy or something else, don't feel like you have to jam a Web3 thing into it. Just to let Jennifer and other entrepreneurs who are kind of starting with Web3 at the, at the core of the business plan probably focus on that. Uh, because tagging Web3 on, there was a little while where maybe that helped companies raise money. But I think that party is over. And I, I, I think if it's kind of forcing it on, that's probably not going to help either. Cool. Thanks. Thank awesome. you. Yeah, we actually have a, a Web3 space in the uh, community. And uh, we've had uh, some founders of uh, uh, Brain Trust on and uh, Darcy too to, to explore Web3. So definitely awesome. that's something we're talking about. Um, hey, uh, Jack, do you want to jump on? Hey, thank you. Hi, Jack. Um, how's it going? Question. I am speaking with the company, looking at either joining the company or investing in the company or both, and um, just going through a bit of a due diligence process on both sides. They're doing a three-sided marketplace where their goal is to get um, or to increase the rate of home electrification and bringing electric appliances in homes, specifically heat pumps and induction stoves, which have a very high installation rate. So they're connecting the uh, hardware suppliers, the homeowners, or the contractors, and then also the electricians who are installing this hardware. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm sort of looking, you know, five years down the line, uh, for, in your experience, what are some of the big hurdles of a multi or like more than two sided marketplace? Well, you know, probably one of the biggest examples of a three-sided marketplace right now is, is DoorDash, which I've spoken about a bit, right? And they've got consumers, restaurant owners, and drivers. And I would say it kind of cuts both ways. The biggest thing is, uh, in the, you know, I, I mentioned in the marketplace checklist, I talk about you've got to figure out for supply and demand, uh, what's your proprietary strategy, ideally organic strategies to acquire both sides of the marketplace. Uh, but then the challenge is, if you've got three sides, now you have to have a strategy for three sides, right? We yeah. talked about not having to pay through the nose, not have, so, you know, the a challenge with the marketplace is you're not just acquiring one set of customers, you're, you're, you have to kind of build two businesses, you're acquiring two, three sided just adds 50% more to that. Now you got to have a whole new side and a lot of three sided marketplaces uh, get burned and go down for that reason, because okay. it's too hard, frankly, they're, it's, it's fighting a war on three fronts instead of two, and two is hard enough. So you've really got to be, I think something that worked well for DoorDash is just relentless execution. Tony Shu's reputation has come out as just so. And, you know, I, I believe in, in some degree of work-life balance and, and founders and, you know, mental health for founders. But I will say that was not DoorDash's original approach. And like, that's yeah. what a three-sided marketplace might take. Like DoorDash was just, working all hours, all the time, fully committed. 
And so that might be, so you've got to think like for this three-sided marketplace, what's it going to take to make this thing succeed? Um, and, and does the founder and the team have that level of commitment and, and scrappiness? The flip side is if you can get it working, in theory, your network effects are even stronger, right? Someone has to siphon off multiple sides, not just the two sides. And remember in the Yelp example, we're sitting there at E24, we had two sides of the marketplace, the cons consumers and the restaurant owners, but we didn't have those delivery drivers. And that was our Achilles heel. And ultimately we couldn't really compete against those kinds of three-sided marketplaces. So it can actually become a huge source of defensibility and a competitive moat once you get to scale. That's the big benefit. So, and, and in, interesting in this example, I actually worked with Tony at my last startup. We were working go. very closely with DoorDash. So very familiar with the model. I'm actually not as worried on the acquisition side just because the network effects in all three of those groups feel really confident about that. I'm thinking more on the metric side of like DoorDash's incredibly high volume, um, uh, low margin where, you know, installing heat pumps and stoves, that's a lot higher margin, but low volume. So that's sort of where the concern scaling comes down to, you know, it's less of that rat race, more of, okay, how are we retaining these customers? What's the long-term value of this customer in, in the sense of a, a marketplace model? So that's, that's some... Yeah, I think that's right. And I think the key is looking as an investor of either your dollars or more importantly, your time and career. Yeah. Uh, you've got to think about uh, what, what the market size really is. What DoorDash yeah. has, has going for it is just this amazing, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars of takeout and delivery food spend yeah. that they could just eat into. Um, the electrification of these kitchens market is is smaller than that now, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, now, online food delivery used to be tiny too. Mm -hmm. So you can always define the market in a tiny way if you make it exactly what the startup's doing. So the question is, what is the market of overall replacing these things? Like mm -hmm. if you, can you make some assumptions that gets you to a market size that's big enough to support the growth you wanna see? And then what's the rate of people doing it and how you're gonna cross cross sell how, you know, if, if you ask those questions and feel good about it, it could be an interesting opportunity. Okay. Cool. Um, awesome. Mike, thank you. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, I do know for what it's worth, the founder of Weebly that sold to Square, mm -hmm. David Rosenko, you should look him up. I think he's really interested in this area just okay. personally. I don't know that he's going to do a startup in it. So you could get his advice also. Cool. Thank you very much. Awesome. Yeah. We're going we're gonna to try to squeeze in one last question because I know we have a, a founder that's uh, building in the food uh, food space in uh, Poland. So, uh, hey, Powell, do you want to jump wow. on? Hi, Mike. <clears throat> yeah, so... Nice to meet you, video? Paul. Can you hear me? Yes, nice to meet you. Okay. Uh, so, to give you a context, actually, I have a meal prep company and cool. we're buying quite a lot of food for the, for the production. And what we have encountered is that, like, we buy around 200 SKUs daily and wanted to have a easier way than through fax, phone or email. And like, there is nothing like that. You need to control the food cost. And there, there wasn't any platform. So we started to build a platform because we needed it ourselves. And I was wondering, why do you think there is no like a global food procurement platform that would be existing. Like, I'm just wondering if there is something we're missing. Like, do you understand the question? Yeah, absolutely. And there are actually several startups that have tried this in different forms. There's a, a company called Silo uh, that Andreessen Horowitz has funded. There's a company called Wholesale. I think their website might be Pay Wholesale with some smart founders out of OpenTable. So a bunch of folks have tried different versions of this. Some of them are around um, wholesaling and, and acquiring being food supply chain for like grocery store kind of food. Some of them are around, around restaurant food, meal preps kind of in between. You could maybe tap into either of those. I don't know if you know, you'd be using the same suppliers that do grocery stores or restaurants or where. Um, so people have tried. One challenge is it's been tried many times. It, it's a, they're servicing low margin industries and so historically, it's been very hard to get a, a take rate. Some of these companies have been able to run up a big GMV growth. But as I was saying earlier, we really like to see a take rate uh, when we're investing. And that's been a challenge for some of these guys. Why they haven't stuck around is when it comes time for monetization, that's harder, you know, convincing 
the partners in the ecosystem that there should be some sizable, you know, when we were talking about benchmarks, the other thing I should have mentioned is I like seeing a take rate of at least 10%, you know, 5% at the very minimum. Because as you start getting the 3% or lower, now you're at credit card take rates. And credit cards aren't even really marketplaces. They're just this, you know, uh, you know, payment facilitator. So if if you can't even take the same take rate that the payment processing takes, you're not, it doesn't feel like you're really adding as much value as a marketplace. Like if you're really adding value as a marketplace, you should do what Airbnb, Uber, DoorDash, you know, Yelp, E24 were able to do. And you should be able to get 10, 15, 20% or more in some cases. I think above 25%, you're starting to get greedy, but you should be able to get in that zone. The problem is in this food supply uh, chain kind of thing, it's very hard to convince people that you should be able to get 10%. It's more like you're getting 2%, 3%, 1% or, or 0% in many cases. And it's very hard. So that's why you can't build a business that way. And, and that's what's held it back so far for my observation. That's the headwind there. Thanks. Awesome. Well, cool. So we are out of time here. Um, but uh, I, I did have one last question for you before we wrap things up. Sure. You know, so if you were to go back to uh, right before you uh, joined maybe Yelp and I eat 24, what would you uh, tell yourself about marketplaces specifically? Yeah. So first of all, thank, thank you for hosting. And thanks everyone for all the great questions. This was a lot of fun. Time just flew. Uh, what I would tell myself before Yelp and eat 24 is uh, one I had the chance, uh, the, there's a work of this uh, professor, Tom Eisenman, that was really influential to me in business school on two-sided networks that opened my eyes to marketplaces. And uh, looking back, I, I wish I spent even more time doing exactly this, just getting to know other marketplaces, talking to them, looking at both the academic, like Tom Eisenman and, and related work. Now there's so much more out there, by the way, uh, talking to other founders, joining communities like this getting to know uh, really what makes them tick because it, you think your business is so unique, but actually everybody is facing very similar challenges and the story plays itself out very similarly over and over. So if you can learn from everybody else and just kind of turbocharge your growth, uh, it, it's just really valuable. So I, I think having spent more time investing there uh, would be great. Yeah, that's uh, great. And then last but not least, uh, so where can we keep up with you? Time for kind of a quick plug. Yeah. yeah, I think the easiest way is follow me on Twitter at New Mike. So if you don't follow me already, follow me on Twitter at New Mike. That's a great way you can interact with me there too. And if you you know send me something, reply to something I mentioned, then I'll I'll try to reply on there. Um, but that's a great way to reach me. Thanks, Perfect. New Mike, not the old Mike, but N E W Mike. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I'll include a link in the description of this. And then, uh, yeah, so if I, I know we ran out of time here and there's quite a few hands raised. So um, maybe if you want to tweet at Mike, um, that then uh, you can kind of ask some questions there on Twitter. So, and uh, awesome. hey, Mike, th thanks again for uh, joining us. This is a really fun chat and we uh, really appreciate, you know, uh, you taking your time to join us and share all of your uh, awesome experience and insights with us. So it was a pleasure. Thank you, everybody.